Hallelujah. We should never forget the redemption plan of God because if he has redeemed us and uh, we ought to remember that he truly has redeemed us. And the Bible says if you don't have the new qualities in your life through your redemption, it's very sad that we have forgotten from where we have come and what he has done for us. You know, it makes us mere men when we have forgotten the redemption plan of God. We just live like mere men. We just live like everybody else lives. We just lose like everybody else loses. We every, everybody else uh, lives a defeated life. We just settle down into it. But that's not what we are called into. We need to remember the plan of God. I'd like to share with you the scripture from the book of Second uh, Peter. In the book of Second Peter, he says, if these qualities of this new person that you have become uh, are not in you or it is not flourishing in you or it is not flowing through your life, then what does it say? In First Peter chapter 2 and verse number 5, besides this, giving diligence, add to your faith virtue, excellence and virtue knowledge you've got to have an the faith that you have received you need to add some of these things into your life that you'll never forget add to your faith virtue which is excellence and uh, you're living in excellence now and knowledge which is very important which is understanding God's word and knowledge temperance having self-control when you have added uh, knowledge into your life, you add self-control. Thereafter, temperance, self-control. You don't make easy decisions in life. You know that you're led by the Holy Spirit. And uh, the sad part about it is we, we, we forget that we have been redeemed. We are changed people. We are new creations. So add to your faith excellence, and to excellence, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, which is self-control, which tells us that you don't make easy decisions, you don't, you don't live your life loose and just let people make decisions for your life, your flesh make decisions for your life. You've got to be led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us to lead us, to guide us, to show us and how we should live and what it makes a man, and how, to, how it makes a man out of us. And to temperance, patience, how important is this patience? Being consistent. Patience, that word con, patience means consistent, being cons, and brotherly kindness, which is important. You may not like some of the Christians, you may not like some of the way that they do things, but still for all, you need to have that brotherly kindness. You, you cannot try to keep away from fellowship and try to say, I have brotherly kindness. How would you show your brotherly kindness if you don't meet brothers? It's important. I know I have met brothers and sisters in Christ who are, I mean, it, it doesn't matter from where they come from, what church they go to, but still for all, if they're born again, if they're children of God, I know some of them are mean. Some of them are, are, are sometimes so religious that you couldn't get into a decent chat with them. But still, you got to have that brotherly kindness with them. You cannot get agitated and you cannot say, well, I don't see good people in church. I, uh, people in the world are better than people in the church. And that's not the way. We still for all, we need to have this brotherly kindness. We, we need to show those are Christian ethics that we have. And love, which is unconditional, where you walk in the love of God. You walk in the love of God. And if these things be in you, and abound, they make, uh, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful, barren nor unfruitful, or the word barren also means it doesn't make you an idle Christian, it doesn't make you a, a robot, or, I mean, I'm just a Christian, no. If these qualities are in you, you're walking in the spirit. 
excellence, add to your faith excellence, temperance, patience, uh, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. These are good, good, good things that needs to be in your life. And uh, if these things be in you and abound, they make you, they shall not make you barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind. That person is blind. There is blindness that is covering this person. This person is blind now. He has forgotten from where he has started his life. He has forgotten that he has been born again into the family of God. He, he belongs to Christ now. He's blinded now. You know, sometimes people just, you look at them and they're so blinded in, for things. You, you look at them, I mean, they, they don't even realize things. They're forgotten. But he that lack of these things is blind and cannot see far off. That person can never walk by faith. He walks in the five senses. He cannot see afar off. He walks according to his five senses. But a person of faith who has these qualities running in this person's life, brotherly kindness, godliness, patience, temperance, and excellence and, and knowledge, that person is not, not barren, doesn't live a, 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 an idle life, and uh, never unfruitful. All, he's a person who's always fruitful, in all his doings. And then it says, if a person who does not, he's blind and he cannot see afar off, sad part, he cannot walk the walk of faith and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Our sins were taken care by the blood of Jesus Christ. He has forgotten. So in Second Peter 1 and chapter 1 and verse number Five onwards, when we read up to nine, I keep reminding myself and I read these scriptures because I don't want to fail any one of these qualities in my life. Maybe once in a while I have missed, but then still I go back and say, oh Lord, forgive me. I don't have this, uh, this excellence in me. I've not, I've not had self-control or patience. Or I, have, I, don't want to, I don't want to be there because I, I don't want to be a person who is forgetful of where he started from. So if you lack these things, it makes you a blind person. Scriptures tell us. You become blind in your understanding. You may have your physical eyes, you may be able to see things, but you really can't see things beyond what you can feel, taste, and touch. And that, per that person is so, you, you will see that person will live in fear all the days. Of, he cannot live afar, he cannot see things far off. He finds it very difficult to see a move of faith in his life. He cannot move by faith. He walks in fear. He only feels, okay, I can see some things. I'm okay with this, but I'm not very sure if this will stand. I'm, I think I'm all right, but, but I'm still. But a person who is having these good qualities, who has added excellence and knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, love, that person is a different person. He lives differently. He's no longer blind. He never forgets from where he has started life. He's always awakened. Thank you, Father. Every time he says, thank you, Father, for redeeming me. I thank you, Father, for redeeming me. You know, it, 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 it's sad when we forget that we have been purged. Some people say, we don't have to remember. I, rem I know that we don't have to think about the old person but when you have lost these qualities in your life, you have forgotten. When you have lost these qualities in your life, you become arrogant sometimes and you become, I mean, so these scriptures, they speak to me volumes. I go back to these scriptures over and over again. I say, Lord, I would never want to be ungrateful to you. I never want to forget that I was purged from my old sins. My old nature was removed from me and my, all my sins of the past was taken care. You've forgiven me. I'm so thankful to you. It makes you a real man. 
to have this fellowship with the Lord and say, God, I thank you, Lord. I thank you. I'm so thankful to you, Lord, that you have redeemed me from the curse of the law. There, there are no generational curses that are coming into my life. I'm so blessed today because I, I'm, 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 so, I'm so blessed and I'm walking in this newness of life. This is To remember your past is not to live in condemnation, but it's always to be grateful to the Lord. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and he has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. And that's the reason we become lukewarm in our lives. Well, we become, we make our own decisions in life. Whenever there's an important decision to make, we think, yeah, so-and-so also made the decision and then I, I should follow him. No, so-and-so can make the decision, but you say, I cannot make a decision because I don't belong to myself. Christ has redeemed me. He was, I'm, purchase, I'm a purchased property. He bought me with a price. So I'm, I'm so grateful that I don't want to make any, any decision that would hurt him. You know, God has feelings in the spirit. He, we can grieve the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. He will not leave us nor forsake us. We can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can grieve the Holy Spirit whereby we are sealed unto the day of redemption, the Bible says. It says in the book of uh, Ephesians, chapter 4, I believe, yeah, chapter 4, and verse number 20. Let me take you to that scripture. And people say, oh, the Holy Spirit can be... Uh, Holy Spirit has no feelings. I mean, it's all right. Let me tell you one thing. It's important for us to walk in the spirit and not walk according to the flesh or the desires of the flesh. And verse number 30 says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. People say, oh, you can do anything you want to now since you're under grace and you know, you... Grieving the Holy Spirit is being ungrateful to the Lord who has redeemed you. These are scriptures that are, that are so important to me. I mean, I can put away any other scripture, but these are scriptures that make me a man, make me to live like somebody who really has a father. I'm not a fatherless person. I have a father in heaven who cares for me and who loves me and who is concerned about me. And I wouldn't want to hurt him even a moment. I wouldn't want to think of trying to do my own will and say, Father, I don't care what you think about it, but I'm going to make this decision because you've been too late concerning this. I'll make my own plans. That's grieving the Holy Spirit. Grieve. That's grieving the Holy Spirit. Some people say, I mean, the Holy Spirit doesn't care anything, anything of, of your plans and the Holy Spirit doesn't care what you do. No, you can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can grieve, you can, you can bring sorrow to him. And the Holy Spirit will say, why would you want to make a foolish decision? And I know that you're going to fall into the trap of the enemy. The enemy has planted something. The enemy has planned something against you. I have a big, greater plan for your life. But the enemy has, has come into your life and he has influenced you through a friend of yours or through a relative of yours or, or maybe through your own flesh. And now you are captured by the enemy and you are making a, a decision on your own. And you think, well, it's all right. But the Holy Spirit says, I know your downfall. I know it wouldn't take months for you to see the disaster that's going to come upon your life. You, you think probably it's all right, I'll just make a decision. But the Holy Spirit knows that that decision is not of God and that's, that's just being led in the flesh. God says, don't do it. You're grieving me. I won't leave you because I'm not supposed to leave you. I'm supposed to be with you. I'm in you to the extent where I become one spirit with you. I'm that will lead you and guide you. But you grieve me. You know, these are, these are scriptures that will keep you strong in your faith. Where you would never be able to, never be able to be a person who would say, I cannot see a things far off. 
to me, I can be so thankful when I'm having these qualities in me, I can say, Lord, I don't care what's happening to me today, what's happening around me today, but I know I can see afar off. I can see that things are all bright and clear. I, I may not see something in the natural that's right, that's happening around me, but I can see afar off. I would love to see something afar off than for me to be so blinded and to just see what I could just feel, taste, touch, and what people say and how easily I get offended and I make my decision based on my offense. Because I was offended, I want to do this. Because I was hurt, I want to do this. That shouldn't be that shouldn't be the ground that you, you, ma you make decisions on. You make decisions led by the Holy Spirit. He is your comforter. He is your father. He is Jesus Christ himself and he is the spirit of God. Right? So I, I make my decision not based on, on what I see in the natural. I, I can see afar off because I'm having qualities I've added to my faith excellence. I've added to my faith uh, uh, kindness, brotherly kindness, and even uh, self-control, patience, godliness. I want to be there. I don't want to make a mistake because I want to see things afar off. And many times I've been successful. I'm talking about myself. I've been so successful in seeing a things far off than to make a hasty move because of what's happening around and I want to make a hasty move now. When I see the things are far off and I know that God is in it. So grieve not the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4 and verse 30 says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Right? Let all bitterness, these are qualities that needs to get out of us, let all bitterness, not a few of them, all bitterness, all bitterness, all wrath, all anger, all clamor, all evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. Put away. These are not qualities of a child of God. You don't walk in these qualities. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, grieve, you don't live in that place of where you, you, you want to let your, let your flesh control your life. You want to be led by the Holy Spirit. You want to be led by the Holy Spirit. And you can, and the most easiest thing I would say is to be led by the Holy Spirit. I'm encouraging you because I see being led by the Spirit enables you to enjoy life to the fullest. To enjoy life to the fullest. Let all bitterness, are you bitter in any area of your life? Are you wrathful in any area of your life? Do you get angry? Or do you give in to grief? Do you give in to grief? Evil speaking, evil speaking, damaging a reputation of another person. That's evil speaking. I believe you, you, you can observe certain things to be careful about. But I, there are certain, certain decisions I make or certain comments I make observing certain things for the sole purpose of being uh, watchful not for the sake of trying to put somebody down for any other reason. When I know something is wrong, I would make it plain. If it is not scriptural, I would say it doesn't line up with the scriptures and that's how it is. It's an observation that I make. And if you don't, if you think, well, I can just do anything I want to, the Bible says you can judge, but righteous judgment. Jesus said in John chapter 7 and verse number 24, he says, don't judge according to the appearance, but judge righteously. Don't judge according to the appearance. We, we, we are so tuned 
to make judgments based on our appearance and we just, you know, when we make a judgment, we just give in to it. Okay, the appearance seems to be nice. In the outside, it seems to be good. But make a righteous judgment. Righteous judgments are only given by the righteous one. Let the Holy Spirit guide you into making the right judgment. I mean, God doesn't say don't judge. If you don't judge, you're going to walk blind. You just sell yourself into anything. There is so much today that you can just give yourself into and think it's all right. Everything which is in the package in the name of Jesus does not mean God. We just receive a package in the name of Jesus. So we say in the name of Jesus. I I can open this package. What about if that package is some rattlesnakes? Oh, I didn't order this. I never expected rattlesnakes. But somebody can pack it because that's the reason the Bible said in the last days Jesus said everything is going to come in my name. People will come in my name. In, in Matthew chapter 24 and verse number uh, 4 I believe. Matthew 24. And when the disciples asked Jesus when shall all these things be? When shall all these things be? When shall the end come? And Jesus answered and said, this is the very first statement he made. In chapter number 24 and verse number 4, take heed, take heed, watch out. First thing is to be watchful. First thing is to be watchful. Take heed that no man deceive you. You don't want to be hoodwinked and deceived easily just because people come to you in the name of Jesus. These are days that goats and sheep are going to be different. I mean, they're going to be be separated. These are days that we're going to see the five virgins separated from the other five virgins. Those who who have the lamp lit, not only that the lamps are lit, but they are full of the life of God always, even until the end but there are lamps that are lit by people. They don't have any life in them. It can just blow off at any time because they are not saved. There is a clear line of demarcation that we are going to see in the days to come and even the sheep are going to recognize who sheep are and who goats are and who are, who are the ones who are, who, have, who, are, who are true wolves in sheep's clothing. Sheep are going to identify. So take heed to no man, uh, take heed that no man deceive you. Deception comes through man. You wouldn't have a demon spirit come and stand with two horns and a tail and say, I have come in the name of Jesus. You would easily know that that's the devil. But you'll have somebody who is so close to you, somebody who can really be so close to you and, and somebody who, whom, who, who, whom you have been caring much about and, and walking with, who can influence your life to make decisions. Take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed no man deceive you. For many, verse number five, for many, not a few. If Jesus said, you find a few on an often, you'll have people. For many shall come in my name. That's the first and the foremost sign he gave. Everything that is in the package of Jesus is not from me. Because you can always use the name of Jesus for anything. You can use another person's reputation with some bad stuff. You can use the name of a product, but that's not the real product. It's a false. It's a counterfeit. So when you, when you look at it, you would think, my it's it's just the original, so I'm going to take it and go home. But when you use it, you know it's a counterfeit. So many come in my name. They are, they are counterfeits. They, don't, they really don't have the fruit of the Spirit in them. They really are not born again. They really are, are, are deceived themselves who are looking for somebody whom they can deceive easily. For many shall come in my name saying, they, they always say, I am Christ. The word Christ simply means I'm anointed. That's what it means. 
Many will come in the name of Jesus and say, I am anointed. I am anointed. I am anointed. Some people have even got, I mean, they're so fed up with the name anointing. When you, I mean, I have met people, they, when, you, when you talk about the word anointing, they say, oh, oh, oh we, are, we are careful about that because we have had lots of people who say that they are anointed, but they are, their deeds have no anointing. They are adulterers, they are fornicators, they are thieves, they are robbers. Their lives don't line up at all. They're just there to put on something, but eventually they only bring, bring destruction upon people. I'm Christ, I'm anointed, and deceive many. Many shall come to deceive many. Many shall come to deceive many because they don't receive the word of truth in love. That's what the Bible says in Thessalonians. Let's go to the book of Thessalonians. Thessalonians chapter... We'll read 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. Verse number nine. Second Thessalonians chapter two and verse number nine. Second Thessalonians chapter two and verse number nine. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Have you ever thought of lying signs and lying wonders? Lying signs and lying wonders? Just because I see a supernatural, everything is not Everything that is spectacular is not supernatural. Everything that is spectacular can be so attractive, but it is a lying sign and a wonder. You are truly a sign and a wonder. Number one, you got to be a sign and a wonder to the world. You, personally. What, it, what, it, what, what, what do the prophets say in, in the book of Isaiah chapter 8? Eight and verse 18. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse number 18. Isaiah, we will come back to 2 Thessalonians. I want to read that scripture, but I want to get this scripture into your heart. Isaiah 8 and verse number 18 says, Behold, I and the children. Now, the I refers to Jesus Christ. Okay? How do I know that? Because God is talking about himself. I and the children whom the Lord has given me are for, a sign, are for signs and wonders. So Jesus is saying, through my redemption, those whom you have given me, Father, they are a sign and a wonder. Your life is a sign and a wonder. Your life itself is a sign and a wonder through which you can always experience other signs. For instance, if you're a blessed man, your blessings are going to overflow into the lives of others, which is going to be a miracle to another person, which is a supernatural act of God. You are so abundantly blessed that you are no, you are no longer of the past. You're so abundantly blessed that you can turn a miracle in a person's life. Your life, your abundance of the flow of the goodness of God can cause a miracle to happen in another person's life. Probably you may even shake hands with somebody and all of a sudden the anointing that is inside of you can flow into that person and heal that person. Probably a person might walk up to you with a lot of disturbance and all of a sudden he gets talking to you or she gets talking to you and all of a sudden that person says, I feel so peaceful in being around you. I was so hostile in this world, but getting close to you makes me so peaceful. What's the secret behind? And that's where you can talk about the love of God and talk about what God has done for your life and how Jesus has transformed your life. So you are a sign and a wonder, not a, not a lying sign, not a sign, not a lying wonder. You are truly walking in the power of God, walking in the love of God, walking in the blessing of God, walking in love, walking with wisdom. 
the wisdom that, I mean, you have answers. You just don't have a, a puffed up mind with some knowledge, but you have answers. That's wisdom. People have lots of knowledge, with, and they're so puffed up. But you have answers, simple answers. And you, because you can see afar off, because you have qualities of the new person that you are. You have, you're, 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 you're godly, and you have excellence in you. You're a solution to the world. You have, because you have the kingdom of God, you, you have the one who rules and reigns in you, one who, is, one who is true life, one who makes life meaningful. Your life is different. You're totally different. You, you, don't, you don't belong to the race that's living defeated. You belong to the race who are walking in victory. So, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse number 9 says, And Satan would come after with lying signs and wonders. And verse number 10 says, With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. All deceivableness. All deceivableness. We're reading from 2 Thessalonians chapter and verse number 10 all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them all not a few all deceivableness some people have no shame I would say and the people who get deceived I would think what do they know you have to be a goat to be so easily deceived you got to be a goat because you, you, you are not somebody who really sees something. There's so much of deceivable, all deceivableness of unrighteousness. People can see so much of unrighteousness, but still they give in to it. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Who are the ones who are going to perish? The ones who have never made Jesus Lord of their life. The ones who have never confessed Jesus, the Son of God. The ones who are only hearers and not doers of the word. The ones who have heard the gospel and they said, yes, we were there in the meetings. Yes, we know. Yeah, we have heard. But they have never committed themselves to the Lord. They never had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They never, they never had the Holy Spirit come into them and enjoin them together that they could call themselves saved. Because these are people who get saved every meeting. And you can know that they are never saved. Every meeting they want to get saved. If ever you thought that you got to get saved every meeting, then probably there's something wrong in you. You're not sure about your salvation. So with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth to be saved that they might be saved. Because they never want to receive the truth. These, these are people who are about to perish and they, they know that they, um, they may not, they are so blinded themselves. The, because they receive not the love of truth. They don't receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. God is interested in saving people to the uttermost. He doesn't want you to just have a miracle only. He doesn't want you to be healed only. He wants you to be whole. There were many who came to Jesus and they got themselves healed and they went back. There were 10 lepers who came. They cried out from their leper colony and said, Jesus, help us, heal us. And Jesus said, go, show yourself to the priest. But one man, he came running after Jesus. With a loud noise, he thanked God and said, thank you, Lord, for saving me. And he heard the right voice. He came to the shepherd. He came to the high priest. All the others were only interested in getting back to society. I only want to get healed so that I can commit my sins. I only want to get healed so that I don't want to be bedridden no more. I want to get healed so that I can go back to my old way of living. And Jesus blessed this man, he said, 
And he's and the first question that Jesus asked this man, let me show you the scripture. I love the scripture. And uh, go with me to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17 and verse number 12. As he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers who stood afar off. So they were approaching towards Jesus, but then they still kept themselves away because they were not supposed to come to society. Verse number 13 says, And they lifted up their voice and said, Jesus must have mercy on us. And when Jesus saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourself to the priests. He gave them an option. Okay, you want to get cleansed? You can go. And it came to pass, as they were, as they went, as they went, they were cleansed. They took a step of faith and they walked out of the, out of the meeting place and they were cleansed. They were cleansed. See, the, see what's very important here. One can be cleansed only, but one cannot be whole just because he was cleansed. I can be clean, I can get my restoration, but I only got myself cleansed. But it can come back again to me. It can, it can happen back because the Bible says in this generation, he's talking about the generation he was talking about, and he was said that demons would flee out of you, a devil would flee out of you, and then come back with seven other demons and occupy that house if that house is empty. Right? So it's going to be, he's going to be seven times, a far, seven times worse than, the, than, he wa- than, than what he was with one demon. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back with a loud voice, glorified God. When he saw that he was healed, he turned back and he turned back with a loud voice and glorified God and fell on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus answering said, Were not ten cleansed? But where are the other nine? It was a question to Jesus. I saw ten of you. All ten of you got cleansed. What happened to the other nine? What happened? The other nine were more important. Their their families were important to them. They want to go back and tell the family, oh, I got healed. I'm okay now. Oh, there was a man called Jesus. He just spoke a word and and something happened to me. I went to the priest and I got his permission and now I'm coming back to society. He said, go to the priest. And we got cleansed and we didn't even want to look at him. We didn't want nothing to do with Jesus. You can get yourself cleansed and go back to society and live the old lifestyle that you want to. But that's not God. That's not the end of everything. The end of everything is is the beginning of knowing Jesus. Where are the other ten? Where were not ten clean? But where are the other nine? Wasn't Jesus interested in the nine? He was. That's the reason he asked this one person, what happened to the other nine? And I would answer very easily, they only went back to the, they went back to the priest and got the permission to go back to society. Let me go back and live my old lifestyle. Let me go back and live the old way I want to live. Let me go back and get back to my family and make everything all right with my family and I want to go back and forget about Jesus. Bye. Thank you, Jesus, for healing me. I mean, just with a sweet bye, they went back. But this man with a loud voice, he made it clear that I'm all the way with Jesus. I'm all the way with Jesus. You cannot stop me. I'm not going to the priest just to go back to society. I'm going to the highest priest. He is my high priest now. He is the new covenant. Blood. Cleansing. Jesus. Savior. Now I'm not going to live according to the oldness of the letter. I'm going to live according to the newness of life. Of the spirit. The others are more important 
import, they, they were more important, it was more important for them to keep the law back again. They want to live by the law. Although Jesus was living according to the law here, but this Samaritan, he understood. Something that got into his heart was different. He said, I want to live in the newness of life, in the spirit, not in the oldness, not according to the oldness of the letter. Right? And he, he came, but Jesus, I, 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 a very sad question when Jesus asked him, where are the nine? Ten were cleansed. What happened to the other nine? He was interested in the nine. It's not God's will that any should perish, that all should come to repentance and salvation. Right? So, this man, he was not only cleansed, he came back with a loud, he turned back with a loud voice and glorified God. He was not interested about going back to the family or trying to get back to society. That was not the most important thing, but he wanted to make it loud and clear. Jesus is Lord of my life. He wanted to make sure that I want to be so thankful. He fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks. He was more interested in Jesus than the healing that he got. He was more interested in going 100% with Jesus and not just taking it for granted. Oh, I got healed. That's good. I mean, after all, I mean, thank you, God. Okay. He made it very clear and loud that I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. I'm a disciple of Jesus from this day forth. Verse number 17, and Jesus answering, uh, uh, Answering said, were not ten cleansed and where are the other nine? And there, in verse number 18, there, were, there, are not, uh, there are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. Jesus said, how come? How come? He, he was sad about it. He made us, the, the others didn't return they didn't come to give glory to God except for this stranger. This stranger is a Samaritan. They were counted as a third class group of people. Samaritans were third class. Samaritans were not, they were not counted in the class of the Jews. They were, well, you don't belong to our class. You are a Samaritan, a second class citizen. But these second class citizens or the third class citizens are going to be seated with him in heavenly places. Jesus himself said. He said that the prostitutes and the, and the homemongers and those who are uh, publicans, they're going to be seated with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you, who are supposed to be, you're going to be down in hell, weeping and gnashing about your teeth. There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger, because I, I see this very clear. Jesus, he was very concerned about the nine. He was very concerned about the nine. And verse number 19 says, Arise and go thy way. Arise and go thy way. Your faith proves that you have been made whole. See, the two, the, the two different verses here. One thing, the, the ten were cleansed until one came back to Jesus with a loud voice and committed himself to walk with Jesus and gave God the glory. He got extra blessing. What was the greatest extra blessing that he got? And Jesus said, arise, go thy way. Your faith has made you whole. Nine were cleansed, but this one was made whole. There's a difference between cleaning up something and that can form back again. But when you're made whole, you're completely a brand new creation. You're made whole. Arise, go back. Your faith has made you whole. You'll never, ever contaminate with the same disease again. You'll never come back with this nonsense again. No demon has any authority over your life because you're made whole. You are made a new creation in Christ. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new in your life. But the other nine are still going to struggle with the same problem. Because all those demons that went out of them are going to come back to them. 
It's not that God heals a person temporarily, but God warns us when he heals us, he wants us to be with him, to give him all the glory. Some people, they just want to do something just to be, if I could only get a blessing, that's good enough for me. But I want to be made whole. Jesus was interested in making all the ten of them whole. I mean, surely the nine would have returned back to Jesus. All ten would have returned back to Jesus and say, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for healing us. Thank you for healing us. Oh, we are so thankful to you. But Jesus means nothing to them. Jesus means nothing to the nine except for the one who believed. So God is interested in us living a new, new life. Not living in the oldness of the letter, but he wants us to live in the, in the new life. He wants us to understand that these qualities would keep us, that we saw in the scriptures early. Once again, we go to the scripture and we close from there. In uh, First Peter chapter number two, First Peter chapter number two, beside this, in verse number five, giving all diligence, add to your faith, add to your faith, you have faith in Christ now, you believe in Christ, add to your faith or let, let these qualities be inside of you. Excellence or virtue, knowledge and then thereafter temperance. That word temperance also means self-control. You've got a spirit of self-control. God has not given you a spirit of fear no more. You've got the spirit of self-control. And then you've got to walk in patience, be consistent. And walking in patience also means the next thing is you've got to add to yourself godliness. See, some of these things that we have to adapt in our life, we've got to say that I'm going to do these things in my life. I'm going to have knowledge. I'm going to, have, I'm going to do things in excellence. I don't do things haphazardly for Christ. I do things in excellence. I want, to, I, I, I want to add to my faith. Oh, I'm a man of faith. I could just shabbily dress. I would just mean nothing. I would just hang around with the... No, I want to live in excellence. I don't want to hang around with the kind of people that I used to. I want to be free. I want to live in excellence. It's not being snobbish. It's not being... It simply means your life needs to portray. You, you need to be the lighthouse to the world. You cannot live like everybody else and think, well, I have excellence. See, God made us to be living in excellence. We have a different nature. So add to your faith. Oh, I'm just a man of faith. I don't care about anything else. Now I know that I got a ticket to heaven and I'm free now. Add to your faith excellence. Knowledge. Have some knowledge of the word of God in you. That comes by reading the scriptures, by hearing the messages, by obeying his voice, by taking time with him. You cannot, you cannot have knowledge if you don't take time. Spend time with him. Knowledge does not e come easily. It comes by spending time with the, with the, with the, man, with, with, with the man Christ Jesus. You spend time with him. Temperance, self-control. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but he has given you a spirit of self-control. Patience, be consistent in what you're doing. Godliness. Godliness is, is important. Godliness is to, is to understand that you are a life, you're, you're, life you're, you're a separated person, you have the life of God in, in you, you live differently to others. No, we are living amongst the world we can. It's not that we can't go to work from tomorrow onwards. Well, we are a godly people. We got to. You have to be amongst themselves. How are you going to give them the good news, the gospel? But you have that godliness inside of you. Let me just show you one scripture before, just quickly. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, remember one thing. You might say, okay, I'll keep my body fit. That's good. But godliness profits you unto all things. In 1, Corinth, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 8, for bodily exercise profiteth little. I mean, it's nice to keep your body. It's nice to, to have, I mean, it's all right. 
bodily exercise profiteth little, which means it's for a short period. Back again, you're going to put on, unless you keep consistently doing what you're doing. But against bodily exercise, it says godliness is profitable unto all things. Profitable. To live a godly life is profitable unto all things. Having promise of this life that now is and of that which is to come. Living a godly life, you have promises that you can always enjoy. Living godly has a lot of promises. The Bible says without godliness, no man shall see God or without holiness, no man shall see God. So if you want to walk with God, be godly. It's very simple. So these are things that need to be added into our lives. Brotherly kindness, love, and if these things be in us, then we're going to be always fruitful. But if, we, if these things be not in us, we are going to be people who are blinded, right? God doesn't want us to be blind, but he wants us to be, he wants us to be away. He doesn't want us, to, he wants us to see things far off. He has given us the life that we should live now is a life of faith. We can see things afar off. We can see things afar off. Heavenly Father, I pray that the eyes of our understanding be open concerning the scriptures that we have learned today. How important it is for us never to forget from where we have started from. I pray, Lord, for each and every person here and those who are viewing us and those who will view later that they would add to their faith Excellence, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, love, so that they will always be the person that you want them to be and that you have designed for their lives. That godliness profits unto, unto all things. Living godly profits us. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for teaching us these lessons, lessons that we would live for the glory of God. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your love and your favor over our lives. In Jesus' name.